computer. Better, machine. better, better, better. All right, we're going live. Welcome, everyone. This is Dr. Grace Telesco um, from the Fischler College of Education School of Criminal Justice. And I'm joined tonight by an amazing guest. Um, this is the Broward Sheriff's Office Crime Lab Director, Claudine Carter Perea. And um, I was saying before we went live that, you know, I always like to have guests on that are practitioners in the field actually doing the job rather than, you know, just theor theorists. Theorists are great and they help inform practice always. And they also help inform policy. However, I'm, I'm of the opinion uh, big, big believer in practitioners, um, you know, show us how it's done, bridge the gap between theory and practice. So um, as I was saying before we went live, you know, um, the director Perea is, is a director of the, one of the largest, one of the largest crime labs uh, in our area. BSO is one of the largest police departments, uh, sheriff's departments in our area as well. So having, having come from NYPD, which was the largest in my area, <laughs> I have the utmost respect for those practitioners that come from these big police departments, um, knowing the volume of cases that they're, that they're working on. And so I thank you so much for being a guest tonight, for agreeing to be with us. Um, your busy schedule, I can't even imagine it. One of, one of the things that um, we had talked about a couple of days ago when we spoke on the phone is that a lot of our students, um, a lot of civilians for that matter, you know, watch a lot of crime lab type shows, forensic shows, all of this kind of thing. And they love it. It's sexy. It's exciting. All the cases are solved right within, you know, right before the commercial. Um, and that's not the reality. You know, we've had a couple of forensic experts on in the past who have talked to us about, you know, what it's like to be a, a crime scene investigator, what it's like to be a crime scene technician. And so you're going to give us um, a, an amazing tour, if you will, a virtual tour of the crime lab for the Broward Sheriff's Office. And I know you have a PowerPoint uh, planned, which is probably going to give us a couple of graphic images. Um I don't know how graphic. I hope it's not going to be too graphic. Nothing, nothing too graphic. Okay. Um, in the past, we've had some some intensely graphic things. We had a medical examiner on once from Miami Dade, and it was like mind blowing. So when I don't think we're going to have that tonight, but you are certainly going to give us a nice tour of what it's like to be the director. What happens in the crime lab? Um, what are the inner workings of it? You know, um, Brit. You know dispelling the myth a lot of us have a myth about it because we're not practitioners so we don't really understand and also at the end maybe we'll do some q a and um, we'll talk to maybe some of the students who might have some questions about how do they become involved in crime scene work in crime laboratory work um, what goes into it what are the credentials that are required maybe you know maybe some of that so uh if everybody is ready with no further ado please help me welcome Claudine Carter Pereira, the BSO Crime Lab Director, and it's it's all you. All right, thank you so much. So I'm going to go ahead and try to share my screen. Oh, and wait a second. Wait, wait, wait. There's that that bad bad audio again. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I haven't done anything different. Okay, maybe we do need to go to the Bluetooth then. Uh, I don't have it in front of me right now. <laughs> I oh. moved everything away. Okay, I'll try, I'll just try to speak loudly. That's better. Okay, Hopefully perfect. That works. Okay, All right, let thank me try you. to share my screen. All right, can I, I assume everybody can see my screen? Yes. And that I am loud enough. I'm going to speak yes. as loudly as I can. Yes, thank right. you. <laughs> no problem. So I'm just going to give you a little overview about the crime lab. Um, so uh, let's see. So the Broward Sheriff's Office Crime Lab is actually located in downtown Fort Lauderdale in the Central Judicial Complex. Uh, and within the crime lab, we have several types of um, jobs that are available or individuals that work. We have an administrative support group. We have crime scene detectives. We have crime scene technicians. 
we have evidence technicians, we have forensic scientists, forensic technicians, and then of course you have me, the lab director, but you have, I'm part of that administrative group. But uh, so we have a bunch of different people that are within the laboratory. And so, as you kind of mentioned, there are several misconceptions that go on about what it means to be in a crime lab. So unfortunately, or fortunately, however you'd like to look at it, we're not very much like CSI or any of those shows that you see. We are not, um, you know, a, completing things all the time as in, a, in one episode or, you know, like everything's done in a day, a week, couple of hours. Everything can take a long time to complete. And the, so the, one of the biggest issues we have is people believe that, you know, oh, well, cases can be completed, you know, in no time at all. And even our own detectives have this idea sometimes. So it doesn't work that way. And then our crime scene personnel are mostly sworn officers. And that's within our agency. But other agencies, um, a lot of the crime scene personnel are actually civilians. So it just kind of depends on where you work. Um, a lot of, the, as I mentioned, a lot of cities within the county have their own crime scene units. But their evidence is all submitted to our laboratory. So our crime scene unit, um, as you know, they're going to go out to crime scenes. So they are responsible for looking at different major crime scenes throughout the county. So they may be called out to various jurisdictions, even outside of VSO, outside of VSO to assist them because we do tend to have later the, the best of the tech, newest technology. We have latest procedures, all things to assist in solving crimes. And we work closely with the medical examiner's office, homicide detectives, especially in um, death cases. So there's a lot of work that they do going out to scenes and ma major scenes. So they average about a thousand crime scenes, crime scene investigations per year. About 50 of those are homicides and several of them are drug overdose cases. So our crime scene unit, this is just to kind of give you a picture of what we have. So outside of our laboratory, we have the crime scene vehicle that you, you look to the top left. And that vehicle is what goes out to major crime scenes. So if you see that vehicle, you know our crime scene detectives are there. And that's a whole command center. There's a space in there for being able to process evidence. There's a meeting area. You can, there's all kinds of things that can be done basically right on scene. And then the other little van that's there is the van that goes out to major cases that may not require the huge crime scene van. And if you look just below that um, to the right, that's our processing room. So that is where evidence is brought back from crime scenes and they'll process it in the lab, in the crime lab area. And then we also have that garage area that's meant to bring in different vehicles and also to bring in larger items that may need to be processed. So the crime scene unit is actually not under my purview as crime lab director, but they are part of the crime laboratory and they are in the laboratory. So just to give you a little history, in 1994, when the lab are in our current location, um, came to existence. There were 13 staff members there, and now there's 18. You can see we have a few more civilians, additional detectives, and then we have the same number of sergeants. So the crime laboratory itself, this is the other side of the, of the, of the building, as I say, and this is where I am. So uh, we basically serve all law enforcement agencies within Broward County, and also we assist other agencies as needed. So sometimes we assist some federal agencies and different groups. Um, we're nationally recognized leader within the forensic science community, and we were the first and only full service internationally accredited laboratory in Broward County. And our laboratory has been recognized for superior operations and peak efficiency in 2019. And also we received this award again in 2020. We've submitted our stats for this year. So hopefully we'll find out next week whether or not we received this great award again. So we'll see how that goes. Fingers crossed. Uh, so the types of laboratories, you could have a city laboratory. I actually started working for Baltimore City Police Department, and that's the first laboratory that I, I actually did an internship, and that's the laboratory where I work. So it's a city lab. You have a lab like ours, which is a county laboratory. You have state laboratory systems, so there is a state laboratory system as well. And you have federal laboratories, and then you have private laboratories. So I want to talk to you a little bit about educational requirements and other things that um, are part of being in a laboratory. So the first thing I suggest is for people get a four-year degree with a major in a physical or natural sciences. Yes, I know they have forensic science degrees, but it does limit you as far as what you can do outside of being in forensic science. They're, that's kind of a hot thing to do. And everybody's like, I want a job in forensics. Well, unfortunately, there really aren't that many jobs. So as a, for instance, I can open up an entry-level position for a forensic technician. 
and I'll get hundreds of applicants for that one position. So it makes it very difficult when you're applying for jobs. And then the thing is also people stay there for a long time. I've been with the sheriff's office for 23 years and most of my staff have been there for many years, 10 years, some 20 years, some people have been there 30, 40 years. So people don't leave very readily. So if you get a degree in forensic science, there's nothing else you can do in the interim. So I always say get a degree in a natural or physical science and that way you have more options until you can get yourself into a laboratory. Um, I suggest either getting a certificate or a master's degree in forensic science, that's your specialization. I also highly suggest that you um, do an internship as well. That's one of the things that I, I'm a huge proponent of is doing internships. One of the other things you need to be able to write well, you have to be able to speak well, you have to be able to explain um, what you do to a jury. So you have to be able to explain it to the average lay person. And then you have to have the ability to pass a polygraph and a drug test. There's all these things that are involved in getting hired within this, uh, within this field. So I'm gonna give you a little insight into our laboratory. So within our crime lab, we have an evidence intake unit. We have a controlled substances unit or seized drugs. We have DNA and serology, we have firearms, we have latent prints. And then last and foremost, we have the quality assurance unit, which is how we maintain our accreditation. So the common duties of forensic scientists, they analyze evidence, they write reports, testify in court, which is a big one. Um, you have to communicate with officers and attorneys and all different people within the law enforcement and criminal justice um, groups. And we have to provide training as we have to be able to educate all these people that interact with us to make sure that they understand what we can and cannot provide. We have to stay current. So we go to a lot of training and we maintain all of these things to make, stay current in our fields. I'm just gonna tell you briefly about forensic science. It's kind of the application of science to criminal and civil laws enforced through agencies in the criminal justice system. So these things, it's applying your, uh, it's like an applied science. You're basically taking the ideas that come from natural sciences and you're applying it to the examination of evidence. So we present those, um, the, uh, the results of our analysis in a court of law. And our job is not to decide what the evidence means in a case. We are simply just presenting what we analyze. So if I analyze something, I was a latent print examiner. So if I was identifying an individual and their print was found on a particular item, only thing I can say as a forensic scientist is that I had this individual touched this item. I can't say whether they committed the crime. I cannot say whether or not they, you know, did a, a particular thing. All I can say is I know for a fact that they touched this item. And so it's up to the detectives and the attorneys and everybody else within the criminal justice system to decide what that fingerprint means in terms of the entire case. So a lot of times I don't even know what the results of my examination mean for the case. Only thing that I can say is I affected an identification and it's up to them to decide what, how relevant that identification is. A lot of things within forensic science are based on Lockhart's exchange principle. And basically that means that everywhere you go, you take something with you and leave something behind. So when I am sitting, you know, if I come to a particular place and I touch a, a particular, a, I touch a table, I touch a door, I have left something behind, either my DNA, my fingerprints, something is left there. However, when I also could possibly carry something with me, fibers and different things as I walk away from a particular scene. So our evidence intake, as I mentioned, they're the ones that take in all the evidence that we analyze within the crime lab. So we receive about 15,000 cases per year. We, every discipline within our crime lab, the evidence has to come through them first. They input all pertinent information into our database and they distribute the evidence to the, each of the units within the laboratory. And they oversee, most importantly, they oversee the custody of over $500 million worth of drug evidence. So that is a huge responsibility. We have four, four evidence technicians that are responsible for all of that. So if this is a, a picture of inside of our vault, our vault is actually three levels, three floors, and most of that is drug evidence. Everything else kind of stays in the vault in a, for a short term um, so that we're able to process evidence. And then afterward, it goes to our property division, but the actual narcotic evidence maintain, we maintain in our vault. So controlled substances or seized drugs, they basically analyze drugs that come into or, uh, or different um, substances that come into the laboratory. 
and they have to determine whether or not it's a controlled substance. So you can get different things in, different types of powders, pills, all these different things, and they have to analyze and determine whether or not those particular items are actually controlled substances. And they do about 2,500 cases, and there's about 6,700 items associated with those cases. And that's our annual effects. So this is just some of the, um, this is what the laboratory looks like. So on the left is a picture of our hoods. This is where they sample evidence and they're able to prepare it to go to the instrument room, which is the other picture that's there. And those are some GC mass specs. So they will take different samples and load them onto the GC mass specs. And then they will analyze that afterwards. We have a DNA unit, so forensic biology unit. They basically take the evidence from crime scenes such as blood, semen, touch evidence, and they're going to process it for DNA. Uh, we use a lot of robotics and different things in order to be able to process that evidence. And anything that's eligible will go into the combined DNA index system, also known as CODIS. So we are a local CODIS. Um, we have a local CODIS database and we are able to submit to local, state, and national. They work about 1,600 cases in a year, and that's about 7,800 7, items. So just some pictures of different things that they have. It's mostly instrumentation, but they receive, um, they look at different items of evidence to see where DNA might be present, present sorry. And then they have, um, what we receive in the lab, however, is most, mostly swabs. We don't receive big items of evidence for DNA. We have trained all of our um, crime scene technicians and the people who submit evidence to actually do the swabs themselves. So they're submitting the swabs of the items that are processed out on a scene, and then we receive it. And we also receive our sexual assault kits as well. So our firearms and tool marks unit, they examine firearms for operability. They look at projectiles and casings from crime scenes and they compare them to known firearms. We also do a lot of other things within the firearms unit. They do tool mark examinations. They do serial number restoration. They do gunshot residue on clothing. So they cover a lot of other types of examinations and they also do have their own database searches. So they have a NIBIN database search. And also um, we are planning on starting to doing, start doing tire and footwear again, but we are currently not doing that at the moment. But they've worked about 1400 cases, about 5,200 items. So if you look, these are the different types of things that they do. So if you're looking in at this slide, you'll see that there's a firearm there. So they test, test fire weapons to make sure that they're operable. They are looking at different tool marks. That is like if you uh, take a crowbar and try to pry at a door or something like that, that tool mark can be used for identifying purposes. I put a little a picture of footwear there. So a lot of times there'll be a, some sort of footwear impression left at a scene and they're able to do those com comparisons as well. And then the gunshot residue, uh, that uh, the gunshot distance determination is the other thing that's there on the bottom. So that basically is to determine, for instance, if someone said, I shot someone in self-defense, but the shot came from, you know, very far away, several feet away versus close contact. So they're gonna look at that um, pattern that's on, um, on a shirt or on whatever the item of clothing is and they can make distance determinations to see whether it corroborates a suspect or um, individual story. So this, in this here, we have a picture of our gun range. So that's the top picture with that red um, thing in the back. It's like a curtain. That's what we shoot into for operabilities. We also, when we need to um, obtain the bullets, we shoot into that tank that's on the right side. And then there's comparison microscopes. Each um, analyst is able to use a comparison microscope to conduct their comparisons. This is just a picture of a computer basically, but it's the National Integrated um, Ballistic Information Network, which is what I mentioned earlier, which is NIBIN. And that is a national database that they're able to take casings and enter that information in the database and then able to um, connect different cases from different crime scenes. The latent print unit, which is where I used to work, um, that is actually a smiley face that is from a former employee who used to work with the share, with our crime lab, and they have a smiley face in the middle of their finger, so it's actually pretty cool, and I use it on all my slide presentations. Um, they conduct the scientific examinations in the area of friction ridge analysis, and you can do comparisons of latent images that can come from the palmar surfaces of your hands and the soles of your feet. 
And interestingly enough, in Florida, we do get a lot of um, foot comparisons because people seem to commit crimes barefoot for some reason, <laughs> but we do. We have conducted several examinations of footprints. Uh, they determine whether a latent is identified to a subject in question, and it can be entered into a database as well, which is called the Automated Fingerprint Identification System, or APIS. Um, latents that are entered into that system, as with all other um, of the databases that we have, if they're not identified, they remain in the system and they're searched on a regular basis, and then eventually we may be able to make those identifications later. In the latent unit, they did about 2,500 cases and about 9,000 items. And this is just a picture of the APIS system. So our quality assurance unit, as I mentioned, is extremely important. They make sure that we adhere to all of our accreditation requirements. And there are a whole lot of requirements that we have to meet. And so it's very important in, for us as a laboratory to make sure that we maintain our um, accreditation. And so we are, we have a, a accreditation cycle of four years. And so basically the laboratory every year, either we have every four years, we have a huge assessment. And then in between we have smaller assessments. So sometimes they just do a document review. Sometimes they do a smaller on-site surveillance where we are constantly being evaluated to make sure that we're meeting our requirements. Um, the quality assurance staff make sure that our analysts are competent, that we do proficiency tests, that we basically are maintaining everything that we need to do to continue um, keeping our accreditation. We do internal audits. There's just all these things that have to be done. So I have a QA unit that keeps us in check as far as that goes. I think this is some interesting information. I like to talk about the personnel. So in 1994, we had 25 staff members. And so we only had 16 analysts at the time and five managers, and we had four administrative support people. And now we have 57 members. So we have seven administrative support individuals. We have 37 analysts and forensic techs, and our management team has expanded to 13. Another thing that's very interesting, in my opinion, is how um, our laboratory has changed with regards to the number of women in the lab. So uh, in, the, in fact, when we first started, the lab had 15 men and 10 women, and now we only have 19 men and 38 women. So a lot, it's completely changed. We have a lot more women in this field, and it's kind of refreshing for me. I'm actually um, one of few female lab directors that are within, um, when I, like when I attend different lab director meetings and that kind of thing, there's not that many of us. So it's very interesting to see how the demographics have changed over the years. And then just a little bit about as far as the analysts and technicians, um, as far as the people who are actually doing the work, we have 17 men and 20 women now, as opposed to the nine men and seven women that we had previously as far as analysts go. So our management team has also changed. We had four men and one woman, and now our management team still has four men, not the same ones, and now we have nine women. So it's totally changed. It's very interesting to me to watch how it's changed over the years. I don't know what questions you have, but that's kind of my really quick overview of the laboratory. I hope that was helpful. And if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Fabulous. Wow. Fabulous. Thank you. You can stop sharing now um, your screen so we can see your, yes. your beautiful face. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much. That was such a, an amazing overview. And I really appreciated not only the inner workings uh, of the lab itself, but then you also kind of gave us a really nice uh, snapshot, if you will, of the number of cases that you yes. that you delve into. Um, that the over, what, would you say that the uh, majority of the cases are homicide, or the majority are the drug overdoses? Um, for, as far as the crime lab cases, most we don't have that many. It's not that many of the serious crimes. Are, are probably we have more property crimes than we have person crimes. So our, um, as I mentioned, like our drug unit, I think they had about, I can't remember the number now, but the, that's the number of cases that came in. It's probably about five, four or 5,000 cases that came in. And so those are the drug related cases, but we don't know if they're, if they're tied to a drug overdose necessarily. They're just cases where drugs have been seized off of a person. And gotcha. so that's gotcha. what we received. So I know back in the day when I was on the job, <laughs> a hundred years ago during the horse and buggy era. Um, we used to, if, if we vouchered, let's say we made an arrest, a drug arrest, and we vouchered the, um, the, that contraband, we would send it off 
for lab analysis because it might look like, let's say, cocaine or heroin or oxy or whatever it might be, but a laboratory analysis is going to give us that that determination one way or the other. And really, that's where it, it really comes into play for court purposes, right? For conviction. Can you speak to that? And do you ever have to testify? Of course. So, um, yes, the, the, whole pro the whole process of analysis, analyzing evidence is to determine what, if, as you were speaking about the narcotics evidence, just because it's a powder and looks like a powder or looks like a pill, you don't really know what it is until it's been an analyzed. So um, our drug chemists, that's their job. And actually, it's become very complicated for them now because there's so many different types of drugs that are now like, you know, different types of synthetics and different types of drugs that are being um, manufactured by all these, you know, it's, it's just completely changed. And so, our, you know, our, our seized drugs unit has to have a peer group that analyzes all these new compounds to see what kind of new drugs there are. They have to keep it, the, the law is evolving constantly to keep up with the new drugs that are being synthesized. So, right. um, but the job of the analyst or the drug chemist is to confirm whether or not it is a controlled substance. And then they go to court a lot, actually. Our, our analysts for, that are in the seized drug unit are constantly in court. And right. so um, all of our analysts have to testify, but you know, as I mentioned, I was a latent print examiner and I've, been, I've testified probably about 65 times personally, but I, my cases were, it depend on how relevant the, the latents were in that case. So I could do a ton of burglary cases and car, you know, car thefts or whatever it is. And my latent could have been on the outside of a vehicle. Well, maybe that would have helped to lead to maybe get an arrest, but it may not have been the whole crux of the case because it was on the outside of the vehicle. So a person could say, Hey, I touched the outside of the car when I was walking by, you know, so there could be a lot of reasons why that print was there and it might not have been as relevant as something else that was in right. the case. So we testify a lot, you know, especially the drug chemists, they testify a whole lot. Yeah. I think that a lot of people, you know, this, this whole CSI effect, right? We, in fact, we have a course uh, in our bachelor's program called the CSI effect. And there's this um, kind of like myth and misunderstanding, I think, by a, a lot of people who watch these kinds of shows where they think that, you know, okay, so there's this little piece of evidence that was found and we send it to the lab. And then all of a sudden it's like, ah, oh, Eureka, this tells us everything. And that's not really true, right? Not at all. I always say that um, in the crime lab, our evidence, we're like, a, we're just part of the puzzle. So when you're looking at it from the whole um, idea of everything that's done, the detectives are doing their work, the attorneys are putting their case together, they're the ones who have to put everything together to figure out what it means. And so the forensic scientists are just a small puzzle piece. Like we don't, a lot of times we don't even know what happens in a case. So, I mean, we testify, sometimes the attorneys will let us know like, oh, we got a conviction. But a lot of times I don't know how, what the relevance of my evidence is in that case. And that's actually what you want because you want to defer from having bias and that type of stuff when you're analyzing evidence. So you want to make sure that you know as little as possible is actually better. <laughs> exactly. I'm going to bring up a case that uh, we probably are very familiar with. Some of our younger, our younger people may not, you know, I, now the older I get and, you know, I've been teaching a really long time and it's just like, you know, some of my students weren't born during 9-11, like they weren't even alive on the planet yet, you know, so it's just like, what? I can't even understand what that means. But um, the OJ trial, yeah. Okay. So there was this big, big thing that was made out of um, out of this evidence, the the blood evidence, the DNA evidence, um, and that one of the officers had there was so, something with the chain of custody right around that case. Why is that so important? Why is chain of custody so important? Um, why you know, and whether or not in that particular case that was a real issue or not. Um, the jury certainly certainly bought into that, right? That 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 it was um, an issue because there's that doubt. And if chain of custody is destroyed and the integrity of the chain of custody is destroyed, then all bets are off, kind of thing, right? Can you speak to that? Absolutely. So that is a very true statement. So chain of custody is the only way that you can actually 
make sure that that evidence has maintained its integrity. So if I, if somebody gets the evidence from a crime scene, they have to, it's in my custody. I got the evidence. I photographed the evidence. I have all this information. I seal up the evidence. When I bring it, well, not me, but when the submitter brings it to the laboratory, they have this item of evidence and they're saying, this is the condition that I'm bringing it in. I pulled it straight from the scene. I put it in this container of whatever, you know, or bag or whatever. And this is the condition of this evidence straight from the crime scene. It's sealed, it's signed, it's initialed. It's on this property receipt. I itemized everything that's in this bag. I then bring that bag to the crime lab. When it comes to our evidence intake unit, our evidence intake looks at it and says, okay, we have this item of evidence. These are the items that you're submitting and they bring it into the laboratory. So that's basically left from the crime scene to that officer, to the crime lab. Then it goes to the analyst. Well, when the analyst gets it, they have to inventory it and make sure that everything that is listed on that property receipt is in that bag. And if it's, there's a discrepancy, we have to call right away and be like, there's something missing or, you know. So that already calls the evidence into question if everything is not as it's listed on that property receipt. So the only way to ensure the integrity of that evidence, and if I, when I go to testify in court, they present me with the evidence and they're gonna say, do you recognize this item of evidence? And I am looking for my evidence tape, my seals, my initials, my date. That's how I know that evidence is mine. If I get something and it doesn't have my seal on it or my seal is broken, then I have to question, well, I don't know where this evidence came from. So if I don't know where that evidence came from, I can't assure that's what came from the crime scene. So it's such an integral part of the chain of custody is like the whole thing. If you don't have chain of custody, you basically have blown the whole case. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And what's really important for our, our students and civilians to understand too, I think is, and that's part of what we do here is educating um, both our students, alum, and civilians, because we, we live stream this publicly on our YouTube channel, Fischler College of Education School of Criminal Justice YouTube channel. So we're educating, we're always educating. And that's why it's so important um, for police officers to know and understand that when they walk into a crime scene, first of all, everything can be a crime scene. There are times when we may not even know technically that it is a crime scene, but it is a crime scene. So you have to be careful not to tamper with things. And, you know, some people might think, well, tampering means taking it or destroying evidence. Sometimes we do things we don't even, we're not even aware of you know, walking into a crime scene, our footprint into the crime scene, whatever garbage we have on our feet, if it's mud or whatever it might be that we're walking in can destroy evidence. Um, picking up a, a, a cigarette butt out of the, you know, like out of an ashtray, going to the bathroom. I used to, when I was a sergeant, I would get so upset with, with the cops who would go in like, to use the bathroom. And it's like, you got to be kidding me. Um, not only are we tampering with evidence and destroying the integrity of the scene, but the chances of us catching the person, catching the suspect, and more importantly, because that's not the only, and that's like not the end of the story. The end of the story is the conviction, if we've got the right person. And if we don't have the right person, that's good too. See, so that, right, isn't it true? Like that the, the evidence... And the laboratory analysis helps not only us convict the guilty, but release the innocent. So I got a question here from uh, from one of our webinar participants. It says, um, and I know that this was going to be a question because you probably like when you when you put up the educational requirements, they were probably like, why you're destroying my dream. Do all forensic science labs, uh, lab jobs need a degree in science? If you want to do crime scene work, you may not need it. Depends on what agency you work for. Um, if you work in an accredited laboratory, I would say majority of the time you must have a science degree. They'll take a forensic science degree. I'm not saying you can't have a forensic science degree, but if you do not have a college degree with science in it, it's going to be very difficult to get a job in a crime lab. Um, I, so, I you're, so you're saying in a you're saying like not only a master's in forensic science, which by the way, uh, we're gonna I'm gonna shamelessly plug 
the school in a minute to tell you all the things that we got going on with that. But you're saying a bachelor's degree, an undergrad in a natural science. Yes, 100 percent. 100 percent. So, I mean, you, you know, have an, my, the only reason why I'm not an, an advocate of getting a forensic science degree is just I worry, first of all, let's say you get into this field and you hate it. And you've been in it for 10 years and you're burnt out. And you're like, I never want to do this again. There's not much else you can do with that forensic science degree. So if I have a degree in biology or chemistry and I go into forensics, then I can say, well, maybe I want to do pharmaceuticals. Maybe I want to be a teacher. Maybe, you know, like there's a whole world of things you can do if you yeah. have that natural science degree. If you don't have that natural science degree, it's like I have forensic science. Now what? So I, it's kind of one of those things that, yes, I understand some people are, you know, we have plenty of people who have forensic science degrees now because it's a big thing now. But right. I feel, you know, I feel bad for those students that, you know, like I said, we have tons of applicants for positions. I mean, I have PhD candidates applying for a forensic technician job just to wow. get into, you know, so, so to me, I'm like, I'd rather you have a degree that you can use to do something else. You know, the forensic science degree is great, but I also am a big proponent of internships. So while you're doing that undergraduate degree, make a point to get an internship with an agency because we hire our interns all the time. And I mean, right now I have two people on my management team who are supervisors who started out as interns. They were interns first and then they got hired as analysts and now they're managers, you know, so. Right. So let me ask how- you this, because this is this is great. And I'm not going to put you on the spot, but I will, because anybody who knows me knows that that's what I do. But um, so you say internship. What are the requirements for one of our students to be an intern? What what would you require of them in order to, for them to come and be an intern with you? Um, well, they have to go through our HR department. We have actually an office that does internships and they handle all of that. But the interns are interviewed by the different managers in the units. Um, they have to be polygraphed. They have to be drug tested. They basically go through the same hiring process that you would if you were going to be actual, an actual employee with our laboratory. Um, then is, if they pass polygraph and they pass the, um, the drug test, then they're in, and they have, you know, obviously they get through the interview. Then we also have to have a position available. So, you know, there's four units within my laboratory, but we have to have a project for you to do, or, you know, so if we don't have a project for you or we can't handle it in turn, because sometimes we have our own things going on. Like right now we have some units that are just hiring analysts. So they're, super busy training analysts. So they're not going to take on an intern because it's a lot of work. But um, if you go through, I know sheriff.org, I don't remember what you follow it, like for join our team or something. And then you'll see there's an internship um, link or just type it in the search internship and it'll get you to our internship coordinator person. And um, you must be in a, in a, in a school. So you have to be in a, either a graduate or undergraduate program. And, um, it has to be affiliated with the school. So you can't graduate and then decide you want to do an internship. <laughs> that doesn't work. Right, right. Okay, so that's cool. Um, and they have to be a cream puff, you know, like uh, mm-hmm. I used to work in applicant processing. Um, so cream puff is somebody who will pass the polygraph, no problem. Person who will pass the drug test, no problem. No criminal background, no problem. You know, cream puff. Great. Correct. So they got they got their their background is good to go. And their current status is good to go. Is there any kind of like major, like they have to be in a school, they have to be in like, let's say one of our undergrads who's in criminal justice, would they be, would they be a good candidate if they're a cream puff? They probably would not get into our crime lab unless they had science classes, but we do have people who intern in crime scene. And so so the crime scene group doesn't need to have a, a science degree. I think they just have to have a bachelor's degree, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so that's going to so, answer our other question by Catherine. Uh, Catherine Martinez is asking you, would you consider a bachelor degree in criminal justice a good option for a crime scene technician? It could. Yeah, that could be a possibility there. The, if I'm not, I, I don't don't quote me because I don't I actually okay. don't supervise that side of things. Right. But I do believe our crime scene technicians um, I believe a criminal justice degree would be just fine. OK, um, so basically what they should do, what we can tell them is uh, to go to the go to the website, go to join our team and try. Yes. Um, and see and, what and see what happens. And, and you know, 
Sorry, yeah, one thing about no, no, that. You, no. can, you can go look on there now, and if you type in Crime Lab in the search in the search engine um, for when you get into the sheriff.org job opportunities, you can actually put in an interest card. I don't know if it's called interest cards anymore, but you can put in like you can put your email in, and they will email you when there's job openings in those positions. So you Excellent. can see what the requirements are. Um, so you could look up crime scene technician and see what they require. Um, and then okay. put in an interest card for it. And then when they have openings, you can go ahead and it'll let you know when you can apply. That's great. That's great. So here's another, Oh, I have another question. So let me, let me get that person first. Um, oh, maybe I answered that question already. I did good. So I can do mine. So you're, you're the director of this amazing lab and you are responsible for hiring and also, um, supervising, evaluating, assessing performance of your employees. We have a lot of students who are either graduating this, this May, right? Um, and starting to apply for jobs, especially within the criminal justice field. And we also have some people from Alpha Phi Sigma, which is our criminal justice honor society. And we have them not just from our chapter here at uh, Nova Southeastern, but also all over the country, which is very cool. Uh, what can you say to them about what you're looking for in a candidate? You said, well, I have one job and I've got a hundred applicants. So once you sift through the credentials, is there something else that makes you decide, um, you know, obviously you interview them, you must, you must talk to them in some way. So it's their communication skills. Like what are some of the other things that separate the wheat from the chaff, as they say. Okay, so um, one of the big things that we look for are internships, because that means you actually know, if you've done an internship, you know what it means to be in a laboratory. Some people get into this and they don't have a clue what forensic science is really about. So an internship is a big thing for us. We'll look and say like, oh, well, you know, this is an entry-level position. They've done an internship in a lab, so they actually really know what it means to be there. Um, one thing I would suggest your students do as well is look at professional organizations and become a student member of those organizations. So because there's training and different courses, you can attend like an international association for identification. If there's some, somebody interested in crime scene, IAI does a lot of training. There's a lot of free training. So if you do the Florida division of the FDII, you can apply for a student membership. You can then attend different seminars. So now when I look at your resume, I see you have a professional membership. I see you've done an internship. I see you've done extra training. So when you go to IAI, you can do workshops, you can do training sessions, you can do all these different things. So now I've noticed you've done all these extra trainings. You have this, or you've already become part of an organization. So those are things that set you apart from anybody else that's just graduating from college. Um, so that's a big thing. Wow. Um, as far as communication is super important, you have to be able to articulate and speak well. Um, so and that's write big, well. And write well, too. Yes. Right? Yes. I mean, writing's not huge because we, we, we do have like canned statements for most things that we write as analysts. Okay. So because we're accredited, so we can't really just say whatever we want to say. <laughs> there yes. are things that, so it's not like, my job requires the, uh, the ability to write because I have to write justifications. I, you know, there's things I have to be, I have to be well-spoken because I represent the laboratory as a whole. But even as an analyst, you have to be able to testify in court. You have to be able to explain what you've done. So speaking, your ability to speak and communicate is huge. Um, yes. And also personal, I, personality has a lot to do with it as well. Like you, if you kind of have to, I, I'm looking for people who, no, like I'm looking for leaders that show leaders, I, not the, even if you're applying for entry level position, I'm looking for people who exhibit leadership type qualities. Some of our questions are those type of questions, hmm. thinking about how you handle conflicts. Those are all things that are very important. So I want to know, like, does this person think, well, if I have a problem, I'm going to punch somebody in the face, or do they have the understanding that they need to talk to the supervisor and they need to try to understand how they mitigate through things, you know? So right. Right. You know, those are some of the things. Dressing professionally is super important to me. I, I find a lot of young people don't 
don't dress to impress. I come, I, I interview people and I'm dressed better than they are in my little blazer and they're in like a t-shirt and you know, like I've seen all kinds of things. So make sure your stuff is ironed, but I, I make, I want to, I want you to come to impress me and you only get one time to make that impression. So I, I shouldn't be more dressed than you are. I live, I wear a dress and a blazer pretty much every day. Right. So if you're coming to interview with me, I would at least expect you not to be in a t-shirt and, you know, like dress to dress for the part. Like you, you want to impress the people that are interviewing you and you exactly. want to stand out. So it's very important. You right. understand there's a lot of people trying to get into this field. So you need to stand out. Yeah. Packaging mm-hmm. and package. Yes. Is important. And um, I love what you said. I love, um, I love how you, you talked about and one of the problems that um, that students have is that they think that just the degree is going to be enough, and it isn't. So the internship is important, the resume and how you put the resume together. Um, and it's not to say that you exaggerate, but some of us have a difficult time literally articulating what we've done. And uh, so we just want to keep it simple, but it's not telling the whole story. Um the appearance is so important. The communication skills, so important. Um, something as simple as your voice message. What does your voice message say, right? So if I go for the job and then the employer wants to call me back and calls my phone and it's like, yo, 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 what's up, what's up? <laughs> that doesn't speak to me as professional. Okay. Right. So, and also, um, and also your email address. Like some people have crazy emails, like you know, sexy CC, whatever. Like, don't put that on your on your resume. Yes. <laughs> have a resume. Have an email that you use specifically for jobs. Excellent. So have yes. a professional. Have my email is you know Claudine CP whatever. Like you know, make it something that I know it's you and not like a whole string of letters and numbers and you know crazy things. You want to make sure that you have a professional email. You can just get an hey. email account. It's super simple and just make it sure. I mean, I, even for my daughter, my daughter is 15. She does musical theater and she has a very professional email. That's what she used to submit for whatever. I don't care what she does with her friends and what kind of crazy email she has, but exactly, you, you want to have a professional email for it, when you're dealing with these kinds of things. Exactly. Exactly. And also um, social media. Be oh, careful yeah. With social media now, now I know that that you aren't doing like a career seminar for us, but since I know that there's so many of my students that are on that are graduating, and just to just to kind of like it's just really pearls of wisdom that you're giving us. Thank you for like how do I get the job versus someone else who gets the job because there's a lot of applicants. Social media so important to be careful of the things that you're posting, because just like evidence at a crime scene, these things can come back to haunt you. Yes. Um, you think you didn't leave a clue, but you did. Yes. So now I'm on TikTok or I'm on this and that and whatever else it is. And um, I'm leaving clues all over the place about who I am and what I do. Can, do you want to speak about that? I agree with you 100 percent. I mean, I, I you know, I, I also make a point to say that as well, because your persona and especially if you want to be in law enforcement and you want, you know, like it, we have, you know, even working for the sheriff's office. I mean, I'm, I'm an employee, but I still have to watch what I post. I can't post anything. I feel like I have, you know, you have to be cognizant of the fact that you're representing an agency or, you know, and so if you're, you're representing yourself. And, you know, it's the same message I tell my daughter, like, is this something you want a casting director to see? Is this something you want your grandmother to see? <laughs> you know, and at the end of the day, if it doesn't pass that test, then, you know, it's probably not a good idea to post it. You know, I realize right. people are very much into social media and, but you have to be careful. And if this is a job you want to do, like it's something, even when you were mentioning about being the, um, you know, the cream puff or whatever, you know, that, don't, cream that the cream, you know, if you know you want a job in, in forensics, then I would say stay away from drugs and stay away from doing things that are not the best thing to do. You know, right. if you don't want to have a career in forensics, do whatever you want. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, right, but exactly. if, if, you want to, if this is the career you're choosing and you know this is a possibility, I would say that you have to make intelligent decisions. So, you know, if we've, we've not hired people for many reasons. You know, I mean, 
and that sticks with you forever. So if you we've not hired people because they've done, you know, beyond marijuana, like I think, I don't remember what our policy is now on marijuana, but I think it's like within a year or something, but other, other drugs, they won't hire you at all. Like, you know, if you did LSD, they're like, okay, I don't care if it was 20 years ago. They're still like, well, right. You can't work for it. Right. So those are things you have to be mindful of yes. if this is what you want to do. Mm-hmm. Exactly. I love that you said that, you know, it's like, Hey, nobody's forcing you to take this job if you don't want it, but if you do want it and you want to, you know, kind of the cream rises to the top, so yeah. to speak. So if, you know, you've got to be um, above above the standards, if you will. So um, I'm, I think that we have another question. Let's see. Again, Catherine, thank you for all these tips. Could you please reiterate the student organization that we could be members of? Was it the IAI? Yes. So there's a Florida division of the IAI. So it's the, it's, um, the website is fdiai.org. And the parent organization is theiai.org. So it's the International Association for Identification. Um, there is also AFS, which is AAFS. I think it's AAFS.org. Um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head some other organizations. I can't think of them right now. Those are the main ones that I can think of. No, that's but, great. Um, if you, the, I know if you're interested in crime scene work and latent and firearms, firearms also has AFTI, but I'm not sure if they have a student membership. Um, AFTI is A-F-T-E. I think it's probably a dot org as well. Right. But I know that I know I'm on I'm on the board for I, you know, like I'm on the committees for IAI. So I know that website very well. And I was a late and pretty longer, so I know. Right, that. right. So but, I wonder uh, if anybody has any questions. Um, you know, we have the ability for me to allow you to ask the question live if you want, just give you microphone privileges. It's up to you. If you if any of our participants here in the webinar want to raise their hand and ask a question. I'm happy to, to feel those now. Um, we have we have a couple of people also, about 16 viewers on YouTube. So we've got a really nice, uh, nice turnout tonight for this. And I'm really glad because this is such great, great information. I, I'm gonna kind of put you on the spot and I'm gonna just give you, a, I'm gonna give you a hint that you can say to me, let me look into that and I'll get back to you. Okay. That, that'll be your out. Um, we would love in the fall, not, not now because it's too late, right? Because they're graduating May 2nd. My undergrads anyway are graduating May 2nd. My master's and my PhD students, which there's many of them that are on right now, that's an online program. So, you know, field trips are a little difficult, but we can also, you know, maybe figure out something for them, especially those PhD or master's students who are in the area. But here's what I'm, what I'm getting at. What do you think about the possibility of a field trip in the fall to the lab? Um, we really just started doing tours again. And just to be honest, we don't allow people in the laboratory space. They can like walk in the hallway pretty much. We don't really have people in the lab. Um, our new laboratory, whenever that's going to be built, which will be a while. But when it is built, that lab will actually be conducive to tours. So when people walk in the hallway, they can actually really see something. Um, I can, I, it would, you just have to see where we are in the fall. So we do, we, we will do tours um, for small numbers, not too big of a group because our lab is not, you know, like I said, not really set up for tours. Right. But, so it might um, be like a special, when I, when I say field trip, I mean like a, a select few, maybe four or five people of my undergrads that we would maybe you know, bring to you or something, but let's we, talk about it. We can talk about it at the time when it comes closer to the time, let's see where we are. And if I can, accommodate, I love it. We will be happy to accommodate. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. No um, Brendan, can you come on a minute? This is Brendan Callanan. He is the project manager for um, everything that you see here, everything that we do here. He is, and he's leaving me. This is his last this is his very last, unless he, he decides after he graduates May 2nd to come back and do May 12th with me, which is we're going to be doing a missing persons uh, unfound. We do a lot of that. Every month we kind of uh, bring on this guest called, uh, his name is Ed Denzel. I don't know if you're familiar with him from unfound. And um, he looks at missing persons cases, cases that are cold, cases that are um, literally unsolved 
And these people are unfound. That's where he comes up with that title, which is great. So we're going to be doing that May 12th. And that really will be our last one, I think, for a bit until the fall. But maybe maybe I'll get Brendan back for that. But he'd be an alum then coming back and helping me out. But this really is his his last as an undergrad show. Um, and so we're going to really miss him. But he's got I th- I'm going to give him an opportunity to ask a question if he's got one. He's a criminal justice major. Not only this will be the last time I get to say this. Not only is he a criminal justice major, but he's also been accepted into the master's program already in Massachusetts, where he's from. He is, I think, graduating with, I want to say a 3.8 or very close to a 3.8. He's worked for me for a year, um, which is an internship uh, on its own and in its own merit. He is the outstanding student of our college. So he's going to be, he's won that award. He's going to be carrying the flag. You couldn't get a better person than right here as an employee. When I said cream puff, he's a cream puff. (laughs) So tell us, Brendan, do you have any questions for our director? Um, Any questions or comments? Uh, more of just a comment. I just want to say um, thank you so much for being here tonight. Uh, it was truly fascinating to see all the different kinds of evidence that your department handles. Um, I really enjoyed how you dispelled like some of the rumors and misconceptions that surround forensics. Because uh, as we stated earlier, like a lot of civilians, their only exposure to it is through media and different TV shows. And it was really nice to see like how it all comes together and take a deeper dive into how forensics works at a large department. And I, I felt it was very important how you made known that your primary responsi- responsibility is to prove who was where and who touched what and provide that evidence rather than trying to make like a case like you see in some of these shows. And I, it just made me think of like how it all works as a well-oiled machine where you're this, you're holding, like taking care of all this part, someone else takes care of that part. And it was really nice to see like how it all comes together. So thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you. And thank you. Thank you, Brendan, so much for being here and all your hard work. Can you tell us a little bit about the bachelors? Um, there's there's a bachelors in criminal justice that we provide, um, we offer at NSU within our School of Criminal Justice. Um, are there any courses that folks could take that are like course, course offerings that are specific to forensics? Absolutely. So uh, at the undergraduate level for a bachelors, um, we have Criminal Justice uh, 3250, which is has interviewing, interrogation, and report writing. Um, that's a three credit class. Um, we have Criminal Justice 3400, which uh, is criminal investigations, also three credits. And um, Criminal Justice 3700, which is uh, the CSI effect, media and criminal justice. Um, that's a really cool case, because as I said, you get to look at some of the misconceptions that the media feeds about criminal justice and kind of how that impacts the system and how society views it as a whole. So. Yeah. And then we have a master's. Now, here's the, qu- here's the question. Our master's is in, in CJ. There's a concentration called investigative forensic technology. And that includes some courses like firearms, fingerprints and other impression evidence, crime scene overview of the crime lab. Um, if someone had a, a, an undergrad in natural science, and then they had a master's in this, in forensic, uh, what did I just say? Well, master's in CJ with investigative forensic technology as their concentration. Would that be something that you'd be interested in? Yeah, I mean, the fact that they have, as long as they have the science to, for, for, for the lab, as long as you have the science degree, whatever else you decide to do after that is up to you. So, Great. and if, you know, like, even like our forensic tech, I, I, I recommend people look at job descriptions for the jo- type of jobs they want. So if you want to be a forensic technician and you look at the job description, it says you have to have six months experience in a lab and, that, and it ha- you have to have coursework in these areas, then you need to make sure you have meet those, that criteria. So if you want to be in crime scene, those job criteria, may, that job criteria might be different. So it all kind of depends. I, I encourage students all the time to look at job posting to see what, what's actually required so that you make sure you're meeting those requirements. Like I know I originally started my career and I wanted to be a DNA analyst because I was getting a biology degree. Well, I, ha- I have all the coursework to be a DNA analyst if I wanted to be, but I chose to do latents instead. 
but there are people who want to do DNA, but don't have all the DNA coursework. So, and there's some coursework that is required, like they must have those courses, otherwise you can't get hired in any DNA unit. So you, you know, we spell all that out in the job description. So I think it's important people should start, if you, if you know, this is what you want to do, start looking through and seeing what the job descriptions are and start trying to figure out that, do you meet this criteria? And I would start early, like, you know, start before your, like your junior year, I would be like, okay, I'm looking for this. This is what I think I want to do. What is required for me to get it? Look at most of the jobs that are available. What's required for me to get those jobs? Exactly. Now, I usually, I'm very loyal to the Fischler College of Education School of Criminal Justice, very loyal. However, I'm not confused and I understand that we're just one college that's part of a gigantic university. And one of the other colleges is um, the College of Healthcare Sciences, Dr. Patel College of Healthcare Sciences. And so there's a Master of Health Science in Forensic Investigative Technology I just want to tell people a little bit about it. Um, What you've got there is um, forensic analysis of trace and drug evidence, firearms, fingerprints, and other impression evidence, crime scene, technology that revolutionized criminal investigations, and overview of crime lab management. So for those who are actually any of our students who are graduating that might be perfect for you uh, if you're interested. And of course, understanding if you, your takeaway is anything, how important natural sciences as a degree is for this field. Any last words? Um, I was just going to say, like, even though it's like some people, we have had people have other degrees, but they do have science, like they took all their electives were science classes. So if you can show me that you took general biology, general, general chemistry, organic chemistry, like the things that I would have for a science degree, or you, you know, those j- things that are required, then yes. I could say, well, you have done those classes. And then if you did an internship on top of it, then I'm like, well, look, they do have the science classes and they did an internship. So their degree says one thing, but they do have all the science courses in the background. And you would just need to detail that in your application. Like, Yes, I realize I have this degree in basket weaving, but I <laughs> I did a lot of science classes in the middle of my basket weaving. You know, exactly. so you want to make Great. sure you, you you show that part um, when you're applying. Well, thank you for all of the work that you do. Thank you for your the role, the invaluable role that you play in our criminal justice system, um, the service that you do to our for our county, for Broward County. Thank you. Thank you to the sheriff who... Um, who is right on when he says you're a rock star. Um, and I wanna, I wanna say thank you to all of our viewers, everyone who tuned in tonight. Um, there was so much valuable information that was shared. And um, again, I'm, I'm forever grateful. So thank you so much. And uh, we're gonna say goodnight. We're gonna end the live stream now. And yes, and we're gonna end the webinar now. So uh, we're, 